Now, here's your hosts, the League Dad, Kevin, Mitchell, and Alistair. What's up, gamers, and welcome to another episode of the All In Podcast. I am the League Dad. I am back, and I have Kevin and Mitchell with me today. Unfortunately, this time around, it is Alistair that is not with us. Uh, but thanks for holding down uh, the episode last week. It, it was awesome. I loved listening to it. Uh, but unfortunately, we are only three strong today, but that's okay. We will we will hold down the fort for our, our brother Alistair. But uh, so, glad, so glad to be here again and talk League with you guys, even though today's topic, uh, main topic, I think, will be a little bit of doom and gloom for uh, NA. But before we go there, let's just see how you guys are doing besides that. How is life in general outside of League? Uh, and how are you guys doing? Yeah, life's going pretty good. I had some good din sum with a friend this weekend. Ooh, and yeah, just looking forward for group stage. So yeah, other than the <laughs> elf in the room, life's been yeah. good. <laughs> okay, nice. Nice. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm also good. I've been studying. I uh, got this like opportunity to maybe get a job if I learned uh, a new language called Kotlin, which is for making Android apps. And I was just studying a bunch of leak code, preparing for interviews, and it's really hard. It's really difficult. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. But whatever. I we'll believe see. in you, man. So. <laughs> <laughs> I believe yeah. in you. Uh, then, you know, uh, you should code. And make Riot's game better because there was a bunch of bugs, which we'll get into later. <laughs> Dude, I was trying to like bug, like debug my code, and like my code is like you know it's like that. I yeah. cannot imagine oh, debugging gosh. Riot's massive, massive code. Literally, it would take parsing through like millions and millions of syntax. I, <laughs> they're they're screwed. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that's crazy. Well. Look, there's a lot of stuff to talk about uh, besides NA just looking like crap. Uh, and so here's the thing. Like after this happened, after NA was officially eliminated, it just seemed like NA with LCS was just crumbling <laughs> everywhere. Because yeah. recently, like I think as of today, in fact, uh, we have a couple of news items to discuss. First thing is Papa Smithy is gone. And then it seemed like right after that, uh, Peter Dunn was gone from EG. So... Let's kind of hit these first because, you know, it was not a pretty exit from Worlds this year. I think the sentiment from NA fans has very much been doom and gloom. And then the fact that right after it's done, we see two of our top orgs, our representatives in Worlds, yep. like parting ways with with their management, with their management or their coaching. Um and so let me get your initial reactions to that, because uh, I think that is pretty impactful. What could that mean for the league and all of that stuff? Yeah. So for Papa Smithy, like for all the like crap I give 100 Thieves, I mean, they objectively have had results. Ever since Papa Smithy's joined, I'm pretty sure that was around the time when they acquired GG, the GG roster. Mm -hmm. Um Actually, he's been here since 2019. So he was yeah. a part of the 2019-2020 where they were garbage. Okay. Yes. I remember his, his first wave was pretty bad. I remember we memed that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, he was still here when they were making good decisions too. So you know, either yeah. that's learning or it took longer to get his plan in place. Either way, they've also got their hundred T next or whatever they call it. Their like amateur level team. They're one of the very few them and EG are two of the very few teams who actually have a third tier below academy. And so I really appreciate that part of it. It's very telling if he's leaving because, I mean, they've gone into every finals, right? Or not every finals, but many finals in a row now. If that GM is being let go, uh, things are not looking good, right? So Papa Smithy, really quickly, he said that he that 100 Thieves was not going the direction that he signed on for. So that is very telling that they are definitely going to be cutting some people. We can speculate that later and some budgets. You're done? That's even weirder to me that he had such immediate success this year. He joined EG and he yeah. he was everyone was laughing at him for picking JoJo over Jensen. We were like, oh, that's kind of weird. Uh, and it was a it was a super hit. Danny was also a hit. So my thing I'll leave on is like my speculation is like Peter Dunn's gone. Is that does that mean Danny's gone too? Because he hmm. advocated so hard for him. Maybe there's repercussions. Yeah, it's really hard to say what the re all the repercussions are going to be. I think they're going to be massive. Um, 
Start with Papa Smithy, though. Like, this guy's been in the scene so long. So yeah, yeah. I really hope he continues to find success. Like, his casting is a part of some of the most famous calls that have ever happened in League. Um, so I want him to have sex. He's a, he's a success. Oh my god. Whoa. To have success in the league scene still. So I hope <laughs> yeah. that after Hundred Thieves, he finds another project. I love how he phrased it in his twit longer, where he was saying, "Like I'm not looking to just be another caster and just yep. move on. I'm not looking to just be another GM or coach and just do stuff. I'm looking for a project where we have a goal set." Um, to achieve something great. So that's really awesome. And I think it's going to be one of those, like, TL lets go of Doublelift, and they, like, or TSM lets go of Doublelift, and they really take for granted all the success they've had. Like, mm -hmm. I seriously think 100 Thieves, unless they do something really amazing or they take a lot of stuff that Poppy Smithy did well and internalize it into their company, like, they're not, they might not do very well because... I do think that he was a huge backbone of why the team turned into a championship roster, just like pivotal members and pivotal coaching staff for other orgs have been the same, right? Um, so that's scary. Um, I do think that Papa Smithy, I mean, yeah, he was very successful, right? 100 Thieves went from like perennial, like, ninth tenth place to uh second place average and i think that their only downside was that their narrative was that they're a kind of a boring team they're a boring really good team and yeah that can be fixed but i feel like it's much easier fix than getting a good team you know oh yeah um peter dunn we've talked a lot about on this podcast how he kind of grates our personality yeah he's kinda yeah like, he kind of says some stuff on twitter but results speak for themselves um he's also paired with uh, coach rigby uh, mm -hmm. He was poised to leave before uh, the World Championship even started. So he was already on Twitter being like, before the games were even being played. So it wasn't a results-based thing that he was leaving after this year. I don't know what that's about, but... Yeah. Um, uh, it's the Korean military service. You have to do it. Uh, okay. okay. So that's, you know, that's just whatever. That's just not really related to this. But he is leaving also, so that hurts EG, because I do think Rigby was legit. I do think that Peter Dunn, as much as we hey, you know, he was yeah. legit too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, is it because we did this poorly at Worlds? Because mm. some of these things are like really massive. Like to so just let go of your GM, is that did that? Did you decide that in two days after Hundred Thieves was eliminated? Because it was Sunday they got eliminated. Today is Tuesday. <laughs> right. Um. So I wonder. Same with Papa or same with Peter Dunn, right? Yeah. So um. Yeah, I, I, it's just why, why. You know, why are we doing that's, this? Is that's money? what I think. Yeah. That's what I think is the the hardest part as a as an NA fan is that I first of all, I don't think it was a like two day decision. I think this has been something that's, you know, been under the uh, it just or basically internal discussions and they kind of knew it. But obviously they don't want to make that public or or maybe even talk about it until Worlds is done because they want their focus to just be Worlds. Uh, so I don't think that's the case. But at the same time. Um, it is kind of questionable uh, why they would do that anyways. Even if um, with the exit, like even before that, if they had decided that, why? Like that's 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 the big question mark for me. With Papa Smithy from his twit longer, again, that's just speculation, but it looks like he wants to really have uh, control as far as how they build an organization. And I think he had that in the beginning and it seems like the team is unwilling to, to either pay the money for him or the roster moves that he wants to make or if there's other things he wants to build as far as internally and processes uh, that they don't want to do because um, someone even asked him about casting or he mentioned about casting and he said he if he casts it he loves it but he wouldn't just want to be a caster he would want to do something have creative control to push the broadcasting forward. So it seems like to me, he is very much interested in staying in the scene, but he doesn't just want to have a job. He wants to build something. And I think that's where his passion is. And I hope he does because he proved himself on 100 Thieves. And I think he could do that in, in other aspects. To me, it is very confusing why 100 Thieves would let such a commodity like Papa Smithy off. And that's a, that's a big one. And same with EG. You know, my speculation with Peter Dunn is yeah, the the personality thing. You're right, results do speak for themselves. But look, EG has done some questionable things because they were 
up until the very end, I think, of Summer Split, or maybe not the very end, but you could see the small, like, downfall, right? And then, yeah. you know, then there was a speculation, well, is it the personalities that aren't gelling well? Is it inspired? We've seen his personality, and it doesn't look like it's um, always so tolerable, right? Like, you can't have um, people like Danny stepping down, and then all of a sudden, like, wonder what happened like is it inspired or is it peter dunn or is it both and so Mm -hmm. to me is it a personality thing uh that has become so big that even the results don't matter anymore or you know not even that they did obviously look worse you know uh in worlds but that's just what makes me wonder like what happened in eg and it leads me more to believe that there were more personality issues or more um, team chemistry issues and that sort of thing. So, I mean, those are my thoughts for that. But again, it leaves us with these question marks. Yeah, and some quick speculation to add on to that. Like, I think with the lower viewership that NA was getting, right, and a topic we'll talk about later, which is the changing of our uh, broadcast days, it's it could also be that they wanted to do this all along. And like this was like on a lot of teams' minds. Like, these are just the top two headliners, right, that are putting the news out right after Worlds. But... This might just be like a good opportunity for them to do it. They're like, yeah, we went one five. I'm like now we're justified. Before we would have got flamed into hell. Now we're just like, oh, that sucks. Everyone's budget cutting because we suck. Mm. But like to me, being having worked in organizations before, it feels like it's usually not so cut and dry, right? They had to have some plans for it, right? Especially for roles this high up. Maybe they were like, oh, if you get three and three, or you get two groups, then yeah, we'll keep you. But it's very likely that they were just like. This is this was already kind of planned, mm-hmm. and like it just became way easier to just like why would they announce it so quickly after they lost? Is I think so they could be associated with each other. That's my cynical view of it. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yeah, May, I yeah I do think it's a couple things leading up to it, and maybe this was like the the boiling point. It's mm-hmm. like similar to G two and Carlos, right? Where it's like probably a lot of things were leading up to it but that was the final (laughs) straw Uh, um this is the final straw probably for it um yeah but it's just like you like to think right like did what was said at the table that's like what i want to know i know i really want to know like what was being said at the table between like nate shot and all the other people with papa smithy was like was what if papa smithy was like hey i want to stay here i'll take a pay cut i don't care i get where the direction we're going like i'm just trying to make something and maybe Hundred Thieves was, wasn't even about that. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I would hate that for this to be the answer. It doesn't sound like, I mean, we don't know, but it doesn't sound like Papa Smithy was like, I need to be paid this much to keep going like this, right? Right. He's looking for, like, it, it like, yeah, money is a big deal in a thing, but it did seem, does seem like Papa Smithy's always been the type of person to look for legacy. And, um, man, it would have been great to if he just kept creating a legacy in Hundred Thieves, but... Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. We are going to go into a very new era. <laughs> yeah, there's so much to speculate, too, because that could have gone so many ways. What if he was, like, pushing for the team to stay together, where he's like, look, Maybe, we're building yeah. something. We have to trust the process, right? And everybody's yeah. like, no, it's time to make a change, right? And, you know, yeah. but we don't know. That's just speculation. I, 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 That could have no merit whatsoever. I think that's the biggest thing is that we just don't know how those conversations went. But... Kevin, you already alluded to this, and I think it's a good transition, is that, you know, as a fan and as doom and gloom as this whole world's uh, season has been for NA, uh, we have another bit of news with the LCS moving to weekdays, right? And I don't know how you could take that as a fan. Like, I, I'm, I'm trying to process that because I know some people are like, yes, I might actually be able to watch those now or something like that. I know for me, it's hard for me to watch games on weekends uh, just because I'm usually like, that's when I do stuff. So I know for me, it actually will be easier <laughs> to watch games. But also I wonder though, like, is that a sign of like things maybe not making as much money or them pulling back? Like I know Valorant, like, or the implied uh, effect is that Valorant will be taking up weekend spots. Um, so I don't know. What are your Look thoughts? Like, reaction? Yeah, go ahead. Did you guys watch Travis's video? Yes. Travis I video? Did not know. Okay. Um, I guess I get. Uh, well, well. Okay, Kevin, you did, so maybe you can just talk about it in part of it uh, that he does give a lot of good info. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, to go into it, 
Travis did a video about like is Elsia dying, right? And he mm. talks about um generally this move and whether or not it's implying that it was dying. I watched this when it was released, so I might be paraphrasing some stuff. But I think the big picture view of things is like there is a world where they could have stats that just say like for example, for myself, I can watch LCS a lot better now that it's on weekdays. It's just mm -hmm. a lot easier. I do stuff on Sundays and Saturdays. I would rather do stuff with people or play games or something. But right yeah. after work or just right after like a long day, like it's so easy for me. And a lot of LCS, kind of going back to what I was talking about, is like a lot of LCS like viewers who grew up like from season five and onward, maybe not season three, but season five and onward, right? Probably are working now. They're not in college anymore. And they might have data that suggests that this is the best time for them to do it. It's kind of a copium tape potentially or hopium tape, but that's possible, right? Um, because the the LCS and the Valorant broadcasts, I don't really know if they compete with each other per se. They might want to use talent with each other or a similar space. So there's that. Yeah. Um, Travis was also a lot more optimistic, I would say, than I think the, everyone just like saying like it's just over. I think everyone just like wants to say that LCS is dead and like it's over and done. Um, I don't remember what his other main point was. So you might have to fill this one for me, Mitchell. But I think the thing I'll end on is like, to me, uh, a lot of people I know, like this would be easier for us to watch. And so maybe that is just the reality or maybe I just mm -hmm. don't know anybody in college and high school anymore who like would watch this. Up. But are there even college and high school? Well, maybe high school more so. People still getting into league and watching right. pro? Yeah. That's what that, again. That's a scary thing because that's yeah. yeah. You're right. Yeah, it's and also like, the fact. Here's the fact, guys. If LCS was the same size it was last year, or even a little bit more successful, we're in, in a recession. Like true. sponsorship dollars are just down. Like LCS could just be making less money. Period. They could be doing better and making less money. They probably aren't. But I'm just saying, like this is just the reality of like these kind of entertainment industries, especially the the ones that are more niche. Yeah, I. That is a good point, actually, that I haven't thought about that the economics of North America in general are just down and in a poor place. So regardless of performance, maybe some of these co companies are going to we're going to make cuts no matter what. Maybe we won worlds and we still make cuts, right? Like, <laughs> like actually, because the economy yeah. is in a really rough spot. Um, that's a good point. Um, I will say, yeah, so Travis Gafford was pretty adamant in saying that the moving to weekdays is not a Valorant thing, that it was going to be like that regardless, mm -hmm. because... Okay. Oh, yeah. Their viewership is going down year by year. They did a lot of format changes. So last year, right, we had Spring Split did matter. The records were combined. This year, we went back to slightly different, right? Um, Spring Split doesn't matter. And so basically, Riot is tweaking things every year to try and get a good formula to see if it will fit viewership. And Travis Gafford is basically saying, this is just the Hail Mary where it's like, none of these little tweaks are doing anything. So let's make a big change and gather some data. Um, for me personally, weekdays are, I mean, I'm on the West Coast, so I do think it's going to be worse than if you were on the East Coast. Maybe, I don't know. It depends when the games start. Like, Because yeah. if it starts for East Coast hours, then I'm going to be working while it starts. But if it starts for uh, West Coast hours, then East Coast is going to be asleep. So mm -hmm. pretty complicated uh, to fix that up. Um, I don't know how I feel about it. I really don't. I like it watching on the weekends, but I do get a lot of times when i have plans of the weekend i'm just like I, i'm gonna do my plans and watch the vods later um mm -hmm. watching it live i mean i've been watching a lot of it live too but i've also been watching a lot of the co-streams and i've also like looked at some of the stats right um viewership for worlds was down 40 percent or something yeah. there's that reddit post and i'm wondering like do they count co-stream views i probably not i guess but doesn't that still matter doesn't that still count towards the game because Double if Medio, Sneaky, LS, Dom, all these people have so many viewers watching their stream uh, while it's going on. Even Rush was doing a, a little bit of uh, co-streaming, right? So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, another point that Travis was kind of make was like, um, well, I don't remember, but I think his general sentiment was like, <laughs> it's it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Nice, you know? nice. Okay, I, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that was sentiment. Yeah, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Um, he did also interview a lot of like just LCS fans while he was at, in the world's venue, mm -hmm. uh, and they were all pretty mixed of being like, "Yeah, this is good for me. This is bad for me." Uh, in terms of personally, what? But they all thought it was bad for NA, though. 
they all thought that like this sounds like NDA is dying, LCS is dying. But it might be easier for me to for me personally to catch the games. Um, but everybody you're yeah. talking to was like an adult, you know? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's what I, I think is the biggest question mark, right? Because, yeah, for us, it does seem like it's more accessible for us. But that's the question. Kevin, you kind of alluded to this, right? Like, I would, I can't wait because I am going to be the semifinals. So I'm going to see what kind of people there. Maybe, Kevin, you were at the, you know, the NA final. Oh, so, finals, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. like, I'm interested to know, like, I mean, first of all, I feel like I'm an anomaly because I'm like a 40 year old dude who watches league, but I've been playing since I was like 28 or whenever it came out, you know, right? So I've, I don't know if the audience and player base is matching, right? Like, it is the audience base getting older? Uh, the players like are young, but the audience base is older because we're we're all growing up now. And even you guys who are much younger than I am, you all are also in like your young professional stage. And so is there new fans coming in because it doesn't see if they're making this change to accommodate more of the people who watch it, which is us, then yeah. it might mean that no new fans are coming in as far as like younger, younger demographics. And that's what I'm wondering. And, uh, you know, is that a concerning point? So I guess the overall question I want to ask you guys, and this was we were coming. This was the elephant in the room is na dying is it is it doomed because you guys said it's going to get you know they're alluding is it it's going to get worse before it gets better but what if it just gets worse and it doesn't get better like this was a depressing world and i know we're in the moment of defeat and so we say funny things and dumb things um but i will just start off by saying that with all of the things happening at one time it does seem that uh I wouldn't say doom, but it does definitely seem like we're on that downward slope. Uh, I I know we'll still be watching it. We'll still be rooting for it. But as a whole, it doesn't seem like it's getting any new traction or new injection of life. Despite, you know, we had the Arcane series, despite, you know, the new skins and the new champions. Like, it just doesn't seem like there's any new thing to keep this game, give this game a new spark. So that's my thoughts. You know, what are your what are your thoughts on the doom and gloom situation? <laughs> yeah, with that, that layup you just gave me, I'm just going <laughs> to... Uh, okay, so here's how I think about it. I think that currently, it's objectively speaking, NA LCS or LCS is dying, but is not doomed. There's, there's a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we've seen the reality, right? That we added champ skew, we added all these tools to make our players better, and... The reality is a lot of these players just don't want to try harder or they mm. can't or their their egos or whatever. They have not enough coaching to make them go do it. I don't know. There are a lot of people going to be cold. I think that instead of asking who's going to be removed from these teams, we should be asking who's going to be left mm, on yeah. any of these teams, especially the ones that um, are getting making cuts, right? So like instead of saying, like, is Corey leaving? It's like, are we going to have anyone on the team for the original roster? Maybe just... Like, like what's gonna happen, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that might be for the better. Like, we're gonna have a crap year. Um, the the thing that will give us better viewership potentially, though, is that those rumors about all the minor regions being allowed to just come to NA for free. Uh, that if that is actually a thing, and that wasn't just a rumor, that can't hurt our viewership, as far as I can tell. Uh, yeah. that 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 might have something to do with the timing of this, like changing mm. to weekdays. I don't know why, but. If that happens, then we're all going to be singing a different tune a couple months. So, you know, that's kind of hopium. But I don't, I think that NA needs to kick in the butt. Um, and the sponsorship money going down, they have to be smarter. They can't have a, like, remember like two years ago when we had like eight analysts or whatever, like 10 yeah. analysts and they started yeah. cutting down for that? Like, it, yeah. it makes sense, right? We need to find the best and we need to have like a hunger, not just like our teams, but also our broadcast teams. Like, we, there needs to be a hunger to make the best mm-hmm. content. And it's not like copying regular sports. Like, we don't need 25-minute analyst sections, please. Mm-hmm. I beg. Just yeah. put it all at the end. Just put the games back-to-back and, like, you know, bathroom break, whatever you need to set up. Innovate. Please stop doing what we've always been doing. To their credit, they've changed the format every year. It's just not enough, right? So mm-hmm. hopefully this is enough. Yeah, that that is a good segue, actually. I just remember what Travis's point was. One of the points was that, like... Um, sure the na scene is dying there's going to be less money being injected 
the real worries though is that there's less money injected into the broadcast and like the effort put there right mm -hmm. so are we going to have less broadcast talent are we going to have less segments are we going to have lower quality segments um what does the move to weekdays entail in terms of just how do we view the game um mm -hmm. like we got we, it was pretty hype right champs Q, that didn't that was probably wasn't cheap that took a lot of time um the three-way split view, right? That probably wasn't easy or simple. That probably took some time from Riot. So if you are working for Riot and then you do all these things and then you look at your numbers and you're like, oh, it got worse. Mm, oh my yeah. God, you know? Um, so that that is a big worry. Yeah, I, I wonder what's going to happen with the broadcast because um, that's how people watch it, right? And I do think, God, when's the last time... I was able to, or any of you guys were able to actually just watch a full LCS day through and through every segment, everything, dude, yeah. it's actually been years since I've done that. Like I used to do that cause it was super fun and entertaining. Mm -hmm. It was back before Jat went to a coach. I remember it was like, what, like 2017, 2018, 2019, that kind of time. I could actually watch most of the day and be pretty entertained. Um, but these days I really can't, um, I don't know what it is. It's the content. It's a mix of. I think also the player base has gotten a lot smarter too, right? A lot of the casting is repeating and regurgitating the same basic fundamentals of League. And then you have Kadrill over there in LEC kicking ass. Like yeah. literally telling you some of the greatest info that you could hear. It's like literally co-stream levels of quality analytics on the cast. We need that, right? I think we need like a former pro player who actually played a lot and is really good at the game. Yeah. And still is like, grandmaster in solo queue and talks to all the pro players and stuff um i think we need that and it's probably a big reason why lec is doing well um yeah man weekdays is na doomed yeah i don't know it's, it's looking <laughs> that way i i don't know if it's gonna like as kevin said you know just because it's going down doesn't mean it's doomed. It's it's dooming but not doomed <laughs> um i i i i don't know if it's doomed but I don't know if there will be a big bounce back, right? Like if the salaries are all cut, if all the players are cut, if all of the broadcast is cut, it's like, how long does that actually take to bounce back? Are we going to be like, we bounce back guys. And it's 20 years in the future. <laughs> like, Oh my God. Right. Like, so, um, but yeah, I think it does need to happen. I think it needs to happen because we're in this bubble where we have the highest salaries. We pay the most. We have the lowest viewership and the worst results. You can't have those things to have success. So yeah, man, if you're going to have the same results, just put less money into it. What's the point? Um, the, the, the goal has got to be with the little we have, we had to become desperate and get reach for higher results and get more. Yeah, I, I to add on to that, like, remember when esports started, like here in LCS at least, esports for League, like those tournaments were not well funded. Like a lot of those were just jank as heck. Even in season one, season three, season four, LCS, NA LCS, pretty like mess at times in terms of like production value, right? We didn't have so many things. We didn't have like a like analyst like board or whatever, like that they do all this breakdowns and we didn't have a lot of the instant replay stuff done as well. And I just watched Smash tournaments like the other weekend. Like those are all super grassroots. Like, but they're entertaining. And to me, like maybe we having a little less to answer to the sponsors, um, or just having more like internally focused like creativity and freedom to do stuff is what we need. Like esports fundamentally is super interesting to me when I watch other ones and they have no production value. It's just two people at a desk just shooting the shit, right? They might yeah. not like swear or say anything super bad because they do have a sponsor, but I think at its core, esports should have that vibe of like people just coming together and like hanging out and watching other people play games that are really good at it. And we haven't had that vibe forever. I only watched like day one uh, of like the new season, uh, like a new like spring split for the new year. I'll watch day one from beginning to end. But then these days, I skip half the analyst stuff yeah. so if it's not a good match. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. definitely lost uh, its magic. And you know, now I'm kind of going back to like nostalgia, but. I think uh, that definitely lost something. I think we, we did hit that bubble. I think the bubbles burst. You know, we were playing exorbitant amount of money for imports, uh, you know, investing all of this stuff. And, and honestly, I think NA fans, rightfully so, have lost 
a lot of hope. I mean, I think it's a meme every year. Like we have the hopium. Yeah, world's coming. You know, NA is going to do better than they did before. And we can look at results and whatever. And there have been years that have been better than others. But as a whole, it just seems that no matter what the excuse has been, it seems like we've tried to address it and then it just doesn't happen. And then to see players like I think Chamsky was a big deflator too. like, you know, this literally is supposed to fix all the complaints you had. Um, and the fact that other regions came here and said, this is awesome. And like, we now that it. might be, give yeah, <laughs> give it to, and they want it. Like, and the fact that our, our players weren't even like playing against these awesome competitions from around the world. Like it, that's what sh- that as a fan, that makes me not have hope anymore in NA. Like it's, yeah. it's really sad. And I know we were joking in discord and saying like, should we just become an LEC podcast? Cause at <laughs> least, at least it seems like they take the game seriously, right? Like they, they want to, it weren't, they're not a meme region by all accounts. NA is a meme region and it's, it's well, very, come on, Kevin, come on, did Kevin. I know. Two? Okay. We'll talk about they that in a second. One and nine. Okay. Okay. We'll talk about that in a second, but okay, what I'm okay, saying okay. is, what I'm saying is yes, results based. <laughs> right. But I never hear, like, for example, like I hear EU is toxic, but mm. in a sense that they, they because they freaking want to win. And I feel like we're just like, I'd rather have that than us just kind of be like, eh, I'm not going to play Champs Q. Like, also, don't hurt my feelings. Yeah, yeah don't hurt. Yeah, like, uh, like that is just frustrating <laughs> to me. So I'm going to leave it at that. And we, I know we could keep talking about this, but we should move on to recap some of the, the um, you know, groups, knockouts, and then go into quarterfinals. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that. It's just I think yeah. it, we all agree that there is something that needs to happen and it needs to happen fast. Uh, mm-hmm. But let's talk a little bit about uh, this this past weekend. Um, you know, the results are in. And do we have to? Oh we, my god! I mean, we have all been right, let's pooping talk about on, it. Well, we've been pooping <laughs> on NA already. Let's just get that out of the way. They're done. It's all expected. At least we won. Uh, like each team won one game, uh, and we did uh, BDU, so like that felt good yeah, a little bit, right? Woo. But other than that, uh, I'll let you guys just kind of give your overall thoughts uh, just on the results <laughs> and us as a whole. <laughs> yeah. So the headline for me was like rogue is lucky that there wasn't an na team in their group week two uh, that was all i'm uh, saying uh, like yeah man we were terrifying Ooh. game one of week two specifically <laughs> against yeah. eu teams it, all right we let, let's like just talk about it. we went three and six it was a lot better than the previous week right, where we went oh and nine i'm mad about it we should have gotten yeah. we should have lost every game i think eu actually collapsed we yeah. did we play better uh yeah, actually uh, let's start from group from group. C9 picked Orn once. This is super armchair Reddit analysis, but they picked Orn once and they giga stomped the enemy team. They played Torbatley. And then the next game, when they still had a very minuscule chance of getting into a tiebreaker, right? If they won the next two games and like all the cars line up, they pick Aatrox and they lose and they get stomped. And I'm just like, I hate this. I hate it. I burn it all down. They ruined my 018 dream, and then they ruined their chances. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's group A. Group B uh, was insane. I thought it was an incredible group. I thought that there were JDG versus Don Juan Kia were some of the most, like, two mm. out of three of those games were some of the most entertaining games. Oh, yeah. Uh, barring the next group that I've just seen all tournament. Uh, JDG does not give a fuck. They, they're no. like, <laughs> they don't know what gold deficits are. They're just like, we're always ahead or we're going to be ahead. And the is absolutely absurd i watched that aphelios with like eight ten kills or whatever like double triple the gold of the enemy ad carry just get giga stomped by like 369's giga chat atrox like i was like wondering why was atrox getting so much prior for so long because whenever na picks this like it's okay right we'll get smashed by like korean fiora chinese fiora right the meme and then i watched 369 like this is the most busted character in the whole goddamn game like Mm -hmm. maokai that was last week's busted character this week it's atrox (laughs) <laughs> um so group b crazy group c uh besides the bug game i thought the top esports gam game was super hilarious and super exciting uh we we can talk about the bug if we want later drx still showed up and rogue had a really bad second week uh they they just kept losing and losing and it was really sad they barely got out guys like they basically they won because this game is is buggy <laughs> they got into yeah. this game's buggy and that's really sad because i I had a little hopium. I was like, oh, maybe at least Rogue can go like 5-1, maybe 6-0. <laughs> yeah, and they went 4-3. And then the last group, uh, 
honestly, I don't know what to make of it. I think Genji looked insane, but then RNG also looked like they were literally dying in real time yeah. as I was watching their Cameras. cams. So yeah, I they were like super <laughs> COVID. Like sometimes you get COVID and you're like asymptomatic, right? I was watching them like, oh my God, they are dying. Yeah. Uh, but they did still stop NA. So honestly, that was so, <laughs> oh, that was, that, not sorry, they didn't stop. It was kind of close, right? And then they stopped CFO. But yeah. honestly, the groups were fun. I'm glad that they were over. And NA did do better than EU. We beat EU week two. Mm. Yeah. We did beat EU week two. I mean, that is like one grain of salt to take where it's like, you know, we took him down with us. We denied Fnatic <laughs> pretty hard and yeah. we made Fnatic and G2 depressed. Uh, probably broke up the, the rosters, honestly. We probably, we definitely broke up Fnatic's roster for sure, <laughs> which is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, maybe, pro definitely, probably G2s as well. Um, man, I don't even know where to talk about or where to start. Yeah, dude, like Cloud9 plays one game of Horn and then they lose the rest. Um, well, who is it? Uh, it was Cloud Templar or Spirit or one of the guys who's a super OG fan. He's, he's Korean. He, had a translation that was posted mm. on Reddit, basically talking about Cloud9, right? Where it's like, there's this theory where it's like, if you play the fighter or fighter, the carry to carry, and you see Fudge down 20 CS, it would be 40 or 50 if he was a tank, right? And then if you're playing fighter into tank, right, where he played fewer indoor and he's up 5 CS, but the skill gap makes it, you know, it's just like, that's that's why it's so close, right? Yeah, Normally, yeah. if it's like Korean Fiora versus Korean Orin, the Korean Fiora or the Chinese Fiora is 20 CS up. Um, so it's like there's that ideology that I can kind of get, right? But then it's like you got to look at it holistically as like a game where it's like all of your lanes are down in CS. So what does it matter if your one melee fighter in top lane is even or is slightly more even in CS? Because you're not winning through lane. NA has never won against Asian teams through lane. So that philosophy never really like stuck with me. I just could not buy it. I was like, all right, you played Fiora game one. That's fine. You lost. You know what? You've been scrimming and getting crapped on. You don't really know what is good to play. Mm -hmm, Anything yeah. you play is bad. I get it. Game two, okay, maybe you thought you could change a little a couple things, really try to edit it. And then you come into game two and you're like, okay, let's try it one more time. I know it didn't work, but, you know, this is what we practice. Okay, it doesn't work. No, yeah. Time to go bot lane, guys. Time to, like, just help Berserker out. Your best carry. Because mm -hmm. I remember in week one, their T1 game, Berserker is popping off in team fights, But because he has no gold, he's one item Tristana versus a three item Kai'Sa. It's like this guy's playing mechanically so great, but he's got nothing. He's got no resources. Uh, and then you go into week two, right? And yeah, I think it's pretty hilarious that they paid a full team fight scaling comp, beat Fnatic, and decided that let's not even try it against the Asian teams. Let's just try to go back to what we were doing before. And it's like, yeah, you know this doesn't already work. You haven't actually tried on stage the late game scaling, right? Because one thing that I will say when we do get to more positive note and we're talking about T1 and JDG and all these great teams and what happens in the quarterfinals and stuff, T1 does have a pretty shady mid and late game. And I guarantee you that if C9 were able to get into a mid game, late game team fighting situation with a better team fighting comp, and they're only down maybe 5k, 4k, 3k gold, that they could win some fights and maybe turn the game, maybe flip a Baron, right? But they never even tried it. They didn't give themselves a chance. They just got completely crapped on. It was like, what, 17 to 2 versus EDG? Um, so I think that their philosophy was full of crap, honestly. I, I just think, like, there was ego, but there was also just a lot of doomer. You heard the interviews from Jensen and from Fudge. They are both saying, too much of a skill gap. Nothing we can do. I hate that mentality. It's true. It's guaranteed 100% true. It's true. Yeah, yeah it's fact. true. I hate yes. that they said it, though. I really do. Um, so but what, that, but what can they... So, okay, so I, I totally get what you're saying. And they, they kind of talked about this on JLXP, too. Like, you know, I know yeah. people were pooping on Budge, uh, picking Fiora and all of this stuff. But again, like you, you just said it. And even with whoever made that translation or with that translation, like, you know, yeah, if he just plays weak side tank, right, they will take advantage of that, the Asian teams, and they will totally destroy that. And then you really are useless, right? Or maybe you could try to hold your own with some kind of 
carry or bruiser top and kind of play the meta and which is what he tried to do. And unfortunately, like you said, like he just mentioned, it's a skill gap. Like they are just better at every facet because if we play a, a Fiora into their tank or whatever, they're going to hold their own and then that tank will be useful. Um, yep. And so I, I don't know, like I, I understand like where the problem is, but it's like, how does NA actually fix that? And I do think the patch also kind of, hurt C9 a lot because of the engaged supports, like not really being able to Sven, obviously uh, this was his weakness. Like this is where we were wondering. It looks so bad. (laughs) And so you talk about, yeah, let's let Berserker carry, but like, you know, like Sven can't handle the supports on the other teams. And so So, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is, yeah. So go ahead. I'll, I'll let you speak on that because like, I just basically like, what do you do? (laughs) Okay, so there's a thing that's like in card games, like I've played a lot of Hearthstone, it's called playing to your outs, right? So mm-hmm. you're in a situation where you're totally boned, there's no way out, except you have to hope that you get lucky, right? So you put yourself in the position that you can take advantage of getting lucky. Yeah, it's doomed. The skill gap is freaking massive. But you play to your outs. What is your out, right? If you know that if you play Fiora into a tank or Fiora into Aatrox, and it's doomed because you're only going to get a minimal CS advantage, or you're not going to get advantage at all, and you're going to get outplayed later on. Like, when you play a tank, though, CC does not scale with items. If you play a tank and you have Orn, or if you have Maokai, or some other tank top lane, CC does not change throughout the game based on how much levels or gold or whatever you have, right? So I do think that there's a like fundamental thing with if you're going to be outplayed and you're there is a skill gap, right? You should bank more heavily on reducing the variables that create a skill gap. So gold and stuff is a big deal in experience, right? Like in influencing how well Aatrox and Fiora do. But the CC of a tank does not change. And I do think that that's how you play for your out. You play for team fights and you play not to beat them 1v1, which is what it felt like C9 was trying to do every single game, out lane them. And go for, like, I don't know, yellow plays. Like, actually play. Just send Orn or Maokai from top and just run bot and gank them. Like, if you're getting out lane, just, like, don't stay in lane, man. Like, oh, my God. Like, I don't know. Because you do get to situations, too, where it's, like, the enemy Fiora top, right? It Even though you're getting crapped on in lane, he rotates a drag. He's actually not very useful for quite a while. Even if that Fiora does have a Divine Thunder super early into the game, and you have a tank who's only sitting on bombies or something like a ridiculous item gap like that, that tank is still probably going to be more useful in the team fight. So I do think like they really just didn't play to their outs. They could have played a weak side top laner who loses their entire turret. He's down 50 CS. He's getting flamed. But you know what? He hits a four-man knockup at Dragon. Maybe they get it. That yeah. would have been more interesting to see. I would have loved to have something like that. Maybe you play Sejuani top, you know? I don't know. Um, so that that's, like, I guess my take on it is, like, the fundamental just aspect of a tank, of a weak side top laner. They have CC, and they can make things happen in other ways. Because, yeah, it's doomed, so play to your outs. You know, don't just roll right. over. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> I, I think that Budge and Jat are full of shit. I think that's really <laughs> absolutely Yeah. But just, that is the worst, absolute worst shit take I've ever heard, that there was just a hand stiff. Like, this attitude is terrible. Yeah, there's a hand stiff, but do you know why I look at history? All right, let's go back to 2020. What did Liquid have on their roster? They were Impact, Roxa, Jensen, Tactical, Core JJ. They took a game out Suning, who went to World Finals, and took a game out Donwan. There was a hand stiff in almost everywhere, okay? Hompton is definitely better than Tactical. Sorry, it might not be better than Core JJ, but everywhere else... They were just worse than the other team, or like at least like not better, right? They couldn't gap them. What did they do? They played to their house. They just played how they did. Braxa was not good, guys. His whole year was a disaster, and they went 3-3. I'm not asking you to stomp your opponents, okay? Even this year, C9 got giga giga gap by Fnac. Fnac just looked better week one, right? In every lane. And they won game one. So how can you look at me in the face and say, they were just better hands? We can't win. Albus, Knox, Luna, were they better than their goddamn other people in their rest? No, mm-hmm. but they still Rocks won tigers. and got out groups. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, like there was Rocks Tigers. They always <laughs> they Rocks yeah. Tigers Rocks in the tigers. game. <laughs> Dude, the CLG when who he's like playing his one trick of Relian Soul destroyed Rocks Tigers, okay? Yep. Like, I, that's so shit. Actually, last year, C9 got out of groups. The same fucking 
or got out of groups against FPX with Doin B, world champion on that roster. Tien, like a lot of God tier players. They were not better. Sure, they went 2 4, but they won the tiebreakers and got out. They played to yeah. their outs. What, what are you talking about that they were better hands? Okay, let me, yeah, let me let me let me let me just pose this question <laughs> and then we'll move on because I, I think this is a good discussion. But if NA had played, you know, traditional kind of scaling like weak side top, but good tank or CC or whatever, um, which I think Hundred Thieves tried a little bit, like they they did Seraphine and you know, tried to kind mm-hmm. of play to that style, and we still got Giga Stomp by all these hard smashing early game teams, like because Asian teams didn't matter. It just seemed like every time I looked, like by even 10 minutes, they already had a three or four K gold lead. Like they just know how to take that lead and smash it down your face. Yep. Like, do you think we would be pooping on them on the other direction saying like, why are they playing scaling? And why can't why, we need to take early fights? Yeah. Like that's my, that's the last question I want to ask because yeah. I get it. I totally get what you guys are saying, but would we have been saying the same thing? You know, like it had, they'd play the scale. Like, yeah. Okay. So, my take on that is that it's about the adaptation. So okay, it's like yeah. it's not that like we started playing this slow scaling like weak side top stuff and we stayed on it. It's like mm-hmm. we were getting crapped on in a style and we didn't change. And the one time we did change, we won. But then we went back to it. So <laughs> yeah, I think that's like true. that's yeah. the really frustrating part. It's like it's not which style we picked. It's the fact that we had results to tell us to change and we didn't do it. Um, and yeah, it's all results bias, right? It's best of one, right? So even if C9 lost five games in a row playing carry tops, it's like you, you know, you could still go into it and you play a hundred games and maybe they look a lot better, but we only saw five, right? Mm-hmm. So I get that idea as well, where it's like maybe changing the variables is not great because this is what they practice, but it is really annoying when yeah. they stop yeah. fanatic after playing Orn and <laughs> top and really focusing bot like it's just so frustrating to see like oh, yeah, at I get least it. try one <laughs> goddamn game fuck man I get it yeah <laughs> mitchell's absolutely right like they played three in a row i was fine with game one actually i was like yeah this is good we played it in try NA. It play- like people who didn't yeah. watch us didn't know but fudge did well on fjord mm-hmm. in playoffs yeah. we commented on it i was fine with that he got he got even against wonder who's not like a god top laner these days okay whatever Try it one more time. I'm still okay with that. Third time, that's absolutely unacceptable. That is the <laughs> dumbest shit I've ever seen. And I would have said the same thing. If they tried three games of default, like tank, mm-hmm. AFK, farm bot, and we just can't, like Jinx doesn't work or whatever doesn't work, Zeri doesn't, yeah. isn't meta, right? Then yeah, then we would be mad. But they just didn't adapt. The one time they did adapt, they won, and then they switched back to what didn't work, and it looked awful again. Right. So that's why people are mad. That At least that's why I'm mad. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I totally get it. I, I and like I that's fair enough. I, I think you're right. It is like kind of just what like the what the crap are they doing? They're not adapting, you know, uh, even with meta stuff. Like if, if that meta doesn't work for you, figure out something that does. Like, I, I don't know, maybe don't force Sven to play <laughs> support, uh, engage Please. supports. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Try <laughs> try to adapt. I think that was a good word that you used, Mitchell, is that we see lack yeah. of like strategic diversity. I'm going to use that word, uh, you know, in NA and they just kind of they refuse to try new things and just keep trying to bang that square into the triangle shaped hole. Right. It doesn't work. Oh, yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, so here's what I, I think we could do. We could go down the quarterfinals list and then the teams that are there, if you guys want to talk about like what happened during the group stage and kind of combine mm-hmm. it. Right. So we kind of look I, forward and look bad. Okay. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah. yeah go ahead. I kind of still want, so I mostly oh, talked about C9. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of still want to talk about EG and hundred thieves a little bit, just for my sake too. Uh-huh. like, so I do think Kevin got to uh, touch on some good things with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so EG, um, I actually do think... Okay, so this is where I do give Jack credit in his video, where um, when it, when we talk about... Think about the teams that we sent to Worlds this year. Actually, mm-hmm. it's, it is... It were obviously our three best teams, but also the circumstances were pretty rough. So C9, auto-filled support, right? Yep. Uh, halfway roll-swapped fudge from mid to top uh half retired jensen coming into mid and then uh berserker is a rookie so there were a lot of things that like are not in the favor of our first seed team so i do give like some leeway in that area yeah it's just it's just disappointing when we do watch like our na playoffs for c9 is that actually their entire run was pretty well defined by adaptation their first really sketchy series 
uh, against CLG was came with huge adaptations to just stomp the rest of their series, and we didn't see that. Uh, with EG, I actually think that they played... Honestly, dude, this is the one group I wasn't disappointed in. I actually think they mm, had com yeah. really competitive games in almost all of them, except um, they got stomped by Damon Gaming pretty much every game, right? Um, but they had a really competitive game one against um, EDG, or no, uh, not uh, JDG, and they did beat G2 Esports. And I thought that they're, they had, you know, just some cool drafts. They were trying different and weird things, right? We flamed the Nidalee, right? Mm -hmm. um, but... You know what? Whatever. Like, throw a Hail Mary yellow. It's not like they played Italy <laughs> yeah. five times in a row, right? They played it once. It didn't work. That's I'm, like, honestly okay with that. So, for EG's sake, I'm actually not that bothered, right? I do think that, like, a lot of their stuff was... Yeah, they were kind of skill-gapped, but they tried stuff. They innovated, and they tried to adapt, and they got skill gaps. I can't really hate that that much, because it, you know... Um, yeah, I will say, Vulcan, he got better week two, but still, man... That, I think that's just a trend throughout the, all the groups was massive, massive support gaps. Oh my god, once you got to this engaged meta, all the other supports in the other regions who didn't seem like they were doing much, all of a sudden are doing the most crazy, cracked stuff. Mako, freaking Karia, oh, freaking yeah. all of these supports who are on Lulu duty are popping the F off. We're not doing that at all. It's fun um, to watch, too. <laughs> it is really fun to watch. I will say 100 Thieves. I'm actually less disappointed than them, too, because I do think that they had two very close games against RNG, and it was honestly decided by a handful of macro decisions, especially in the Seraphine Senate game. It was really, the game was decided by macro decisions to play around Baron versus Drag, right, positioning in team fights, and just a couple of mechanical misplays missing skill shots here and there. And for 100 Thief's sake, I'm actually not that bummed, because, yeah, that is what we call skill gap. The rest, though, I mean... They played to their style, and at least someday looks damn good on Aatrox, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Fudge did not, you know, Impact did not, but hey, at least uh, at least someday did. Um, and yeah, I will say that the comps from 100 of these were all good, which I cannot say for C9 and EG. Um, so it, 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 it was bad. It was rough. But God, like... The effort that I felt like EG and 100 Thieves were able to show off versus C9, that was the most disappointing thing when it was our first seed and it was like C9, our international team, with all these players that have done it so many times. So that that's my final thing. I, I, I wanted to give a little bit of happiness to EG and 100 Thieves that their drafts and their play were actually, it seemed like they were trying. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up too because I I, I think me and Kevin were both nodding because I feel like uh, we kind of have that same sentiment too. Like they they yeah. they did show some stuff, even though the records don't show it. Like uh, I wasn't as disappointed with it. I think we harped on C9 a lot because uh, you you're right. They're number one. They did show a lot of adaptation, and you know there's high expectations, and we I think we were expecting to see some crazy crazy things from them and uh we did see crazy just not crazy good things <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> yeah. so all right so let's let's look at these uh brackets uh, for quarterfinals and then like i said like when we mentioned the teams talk about like anything that you saw from them uh in the group stage as well so uh first bracket we got rogue versus jdg and then rng versus t1 so let's let's start there uh let's go with rogue jdg and of course with rogue i have to bring up the fact that we've alluded to if it had not been for that bug in the TS uh, GAM game, like, would Rogue even be here? And I feel bad. Okay, I feel bad for TES because, yeah, they, they shouldn't have been in that position in the first place. They should have mm -hmm. won it handily. So mm -hmm. I don't feel bad, but I do feel bad that a bug kind of decided, like, the outcome. So, again, their fault for being in that position in the first place, but unfortunately not their fault that they also yeah, the could have been involved. out. So, yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll leave it at that and let you guys talk. So, Rogue JDG, if you want to talk about the bug, too. Yeah. So, here's the thing. Like, Rogue, yeah, they had a garbage second week. They went one and three. They barely, like, did anything. And they kind of just got giga stomped by top in the match that didn't matter. But here's the, the other thing is, like, they might have just played crap that they weren't going to play because it didn't matter, right? They they're, know mm -hmm. they're going to groups. And or they're getting out of groups. And they know that first seed and second seed does not matter. You are screwed either way. They're mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like all the picks that <laughs> yeah. they could have rolled into, like well, they they against they could have gone against like Gen G, JDG, or T1, right? As second seed, but it's not much better than first seed. So it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't. Save your strats. 
So it is possible that if Top had won that game, Rogue would have looked less shit, right? Because they actually had to try. Um, but then again, all the interviews did say they did sound kind of dejected and they're like, oh, this kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> this is me just saying, like, maybe subconsciously you just try less, right? Like, and they subcon, they don't actively think we're going to be good now when they're eliminated. No, they're just like, oh, I guess we're out. And then they start playing like themselves and they can win mm-hmm. one or two games. Uh, JDG looked incredible. They, their first match against Domo, yeah. they like showed incredible team fighting. Like, all of the second week, they like, they're the only team in the modern league in a while that I'm just like, they're down 4K. I'm like, I don't know how they're going to come back here, but they're going to come back. Mm-hmm. That Aphelios was up so much money. That whole enemy team was up so much money. And like, it's not even just a question of just 369. Actually, Yugao was the unsung hero of that game. His Silas was doing incredible damage and sustain. I mean, just being a nuisance, even though they were behind the whole time. Their target selection is insane. They make Vi look like a real character when she, I still don't like her. In most drafts, yeah. but mm-hmm. a couple teams yeah. make it work. So I think JDG is going to win. I think it's going to be a three-one because JDG always gives up a lead, and so like yeah, yeah one of those times you're going to lose. Uh, but there's a huge gap. JDG is maybe the best team or second best team, depending on what yeah. you value. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I I definitely think it's uh, very JDG favored. Rogue did <laughs> not have a lot of options going into quarterfinals. Um, first or second seed? Nope, doesn't matter. Because then, you know, if you're first seed and you're looking at your second seeds, it's what it's uh, freaking Danwon Gaming. It's freaking EDG. DR, uh, you know, no, not DR, R, um, no. RNG. Like these are not <laughs> teams by any means. It doesn't really matter what you pick. Uh, and and honestly, when you get to the stage and you do get to the highest level, all these Asian teams are just looking at matchups, right? It's not about the seeding. It's not about even, like, you know, anything but how do their players and their champion pools really match up with ours, right? Mm Because, like, I think the skill gap is, like, also just super minimal between these top teams. But then you do look at JDG versus Rogue. Yeah, there's a massive massive skill gap going to be seen here. Um, I will say for LEC teams in general, it is so funny. I think they revolutionized the world meta. I think that bringing in the Lucian Nami with Aerie uh, and then putting it in like skirmishy, uh, but also team fight scaling comps was like actually the thing. And every single team just stole it and did oh, yeah. it better than them. It was taking <laughs> away the Lucian, right? I actually think EG, uh, their game where they first picked somebody, I think they first picked Azir, right? And then the enemy team uh, picked Lucian Nami and they responded with Callista and something else. Uh-huh. I actually think the right call there was to first pick Lucian. Like, no joke. I do think that that's how strong that this bot lane pick ha- is now because um, a lot of other bot liners got nerfed, right? One of the things that you would do against Lucian Nami is you would you would sit in lane and you would get crapped on and you outscale them with Sivir Yumi or Zeri Lulu or something like that. But Sivir got nerfed. Yumi, all the other enchanters got nerfed. Yumi is top prio, is mostly banned. So there's not a lot of stuff that can test Lucian Nami now in lane. Um, so I think it's funny that you really did revolutionize the, the beta and then Asian yeah. teams just took it and beat them with it. So <laughs> I do really think that um, it's Rogue's, that, that was just Rogue's thing. They, they were the best at the new meta. They were the best EU team and they had nothing else to show. Their week of adaptation that they got from uh, week one to week two wasn't existent. And we all know Korean teams and have just the ins- most insane adaptation from week one to week two. Chinese teams actually historically don't. They do worse in uh, week two compared to week one. Korean teams, though, they always bring it together week two. They always make it out of the groups, and they almost always make it out first. Um, so, yeah, rip, rough, rough stuff for uh, for Rogue. I don't think they're gonna. I don't think they're gonna beat JDG. JDG uh, is my was my uh, favorite to win the whole thing. Yeah, I think it's funny that Top Esports just pulled an exact FPX. Everybody was like. I know they lost the finals, but you know what? FPX is going to win the whole thing. They look too dang good. And then they drop out of groups. Yeah. Top Esports, I know they lost in the finals, right? But they're going to top the group, and they're going to make it, <laughs> and they're going to win the whole thing. Oops, Top Esports is not here anymore. Um, yeah, I think JDG has just got that that vibe. They have the vibe that uh, EG has, where it's, we're losing, we're losing. Oh, we skirmish you, we outplay you, and we win. All right. Oh, by the way, our ADC is absolutely popping off. He just penta kills you. Like Hope is the guy who dies in lane and then penta kills you later. Like he is so <laughs> freaking crazy good at that stuff. Um, and you just have to wonder, like, 
if this if JDG just like shores up the early game a, a little bit, right? Aren't they just the most insane team ever? Yeah. Like, aren't they just absolutely cracked? Um, yeah, three six nine versus Zeus. I hope we get to see that at some point because that is going to be the most insane top lane matchup. I swear to God, though, if we get tank versus tank up in that situation, I'm going to be really pissed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but oh, if God. we get some spicy stuff, right, I do would love to see the Fiora Aatrox matchup because it is not free for Fiora by any means. It is very difficult. It's like Fiora is really looking for that one item to start actually uh, out being able to like outplay fully and kill the Aatrox. Otherwise, it's just like Fiora's just, he's just hanging out, waiting to dodge Qs and farm up, right? So... Um, mm -hmm. I would love to see some of this stuff. So what yeah. you, do you think? Taking this. Do you yeah. think Rogue is going to take a game at all, or is it clean sweep? I think it's a three-zero. Honestly, I, okay. I Rogue would have to absolutely innovate to just get a single game off because I do think the skill gap is so huge. It's yeah, man, it's rough, man. <laughs> yeah, it sucks because I wanted Rogue to at least make it to semi so that I could cheer for them when. Yeah. I get there, but yeah. I don't think it's going to happen. So <laughs> I'm going with the clean sweep here. Like Rogue didn't look good. I think they had a good first week, but I think by this time, the Asian teams have warmed up and uh, it's just no no hope for them, unfortunately. Um, now let's talk about RNG and T1 because I'm expecting Rogue to get eliminated. So my new team that I want to win now. Well, not really new because I've kind of wanted them to win anyways. It's T1. Just because I'm always going for Faker. I don't care. I want to go for the oldest veteran or, you know, the veteran, the old guy because I'm old. And dang it, we still want to win too, right? So RNG versus T1. Let's talk about them. What are your thoughts? What are your predictions? Go. Yeah, I mean, we got the MSI rematch in a quarterfinal. Holy oh, crap. Oh, yeah. And I think yeah. this is ridiculous. I mean, I think this is a great quarterfinal matchup. If I had tickets, I would definitely want to see this. Uh, I think that we... T1 is looking stronger recently than RNG is. I mean, RNG just looked dead, literally dead. Yeah, uh, the right. The second week, but um, they, they've definitely had hiccups. Uh, when they look good, they look insane. I think Shahu is still playing really well this tournament, which is a good sign at Worlds, because MSI, mm -hmm. I have no worries. If he's not playing well at Worlds, I'm like, ooh... But so far, he's been playing good. So that's the biggest question mark for me. I think Wei is having a bad tournament so far. That's a big problem for their team because he's he's gapped Kehanian before. He's gapped Owner before. Uh, yeah. All that's to say, though, this is the year RNG finally beat T1 in a best of five and broke that like chip on their shoulder that they just lose most of their best of fives against it. Like, I, I, a lot of us thought it was just not going to happen. So I hope it's a repeat, actually. I hope that they can do it again. I think it's a 3-2. T1 is the favorite, though. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but uh, I would like to see RNG actually make it to a World Championship Finals and win someday if they can, <laughs> yeah. because they, they're they the one, after EDG, they were the Chinese org that deserved it the most. Yeah, yeah. yeah RNG's been around for so long, and so is T1. Both of these teams, absolute legacy. Yep. Um, I think there's a stat where like their first best of five that these two teams played was like what 10 years ago or something crazy wow and baker yeah. was still in it or i don't know if it's 10 years or it was nine years or eight years it's just a long season three ass time. finals and season four finals yeah yeah season three or finals season four that's... was samsung but yeah season three finals that's nine years ago right so mm -hmm. that's that's really long time from now that the, that was their uh the first best of five so uh, historical matchup, and to think Faker is still in it is crazy, man. Yeah, that man. That is just absolute insanity. And he's still one of the best. He's still the GOAT. Um, I, I gotta say, though, like, one of the things that does depress me in general is that, yeah, COVID's a real thing. Like, these guys are mm. actually dying. Like, legit. Yeah. I got COVID earlier this year, and I was legit dying. I was super not feeling well uh, for a solid, like, week or so. Um, so I hope RNG can play their best, because no, like, not even T1. They don't want to beat RNG when they're in COVID and not even playing their best, right? Like, yeah, if you're 100 Thieves, you know, I take those. I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, let's beat RNG. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> but yep. if you're T1, you know, you want to beat a full-powered RNG. That's that's the respect that they deserve. Um, so I, I, I do – I think I'm going to favor T1 here because I do think that RNG is more of a JDG in that they are slower in the early game. I have also noticed that Wei is just kind of not pulling it all up. Um, he's their jungler, right, Ray? Um, yes, Wei is the Yeah, he's, he hasn't really been um, 
he hasn't really been the bee's knees. You know, he's been kind of just hanging out. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. It's hard to say, though. This matchup is tough because I do think T1 still has a pretty pretty bad uh, mid game and late game sometimes when it comes to team fighting. But then it's like carry is on melee supports and engage supports and playmaking and stuff. So this is a tough one. This is a tough one. But then Gallop Ming, you know, it's all these things back and forth. Oh, my God, these guys are crazy. <laughs> Gumayushi's um, gonna give this series, man. <laughs> Gumayushi, oh, hey, God. Gumayushi's been playing super freaking well this yeah. tournament. He actually has turned it on, literally from playing like dog shit in the LCK finals to popping off uh, on the world stage. Uh, he, he played well against EDG, so That's fair. it's hard to say. Hard to say. What do, what do you? Th what, what should I go? Should I go T1 or, or RNG? You guys go are with your heart. Us. You guys are both. We're yeah, I'm, go so I'm go no, I'm, mode. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going T1. I think I'm going to go T1. I yeah. do think I'm going to go T1. Uh, they are the favorites for sure. And I do think that this just their early game is too solid. It's too clean. It's like team fighting is so easy with a gold lead. And I do think that obviously team one's not a slouch in team fighting either. Right. And I do think that like, yeah, I don't know. Owner is going to gap way. I think, I think that's going to happen. I do think Zeus is going to dumpster breathe too. I think that's going to happen as well. I, I do. It's just going to be mid and bot. That's going to be probably favored for RNG. So I'm going to go with T1. I'm going to go three, two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, this one, I'm not really looking at objectively. I'm just going with my heart because, <laughs> you know, I want T1 to win. I do think RNG um, has looked good. And again, th I don't think it's going to be an easy matchup. And honestly, it could go either way. I do think it's going to go five games. I know that's kind of like, eh, you're not taking a, a leap of faith there. But it's. I just think that's actually what's going to happen because the, the, these teams are so, uh, you know, good. I mean, uh, but I, I do want T1 to win. So that's that's what I'm going with. Uh, but let's talk about the, the other bracket now. So we have uh, DK. We have Damwon. We have Gen G. Damwon versus Gen G. Then we have EDG versus DRX. So. Let's start with Damwon versus Gen G. Uh, this is gonna be it's gonna be nice. It's gonna be good. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of a little bit of a civil war here, right? Regional war. Uh, but yeah. what are your what are your thoughts on this? I mean, so this is probably the best group draws possible from a neutral standpoint. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. For for context, because three Korean teams were first seeds and one LPL team was uh, first seed, there had to be a civil war. There just had to be yeah. by default. This is the best one because this is the most competitive one. Every year, as of late, it was always just like Dom one versus DRX or just mm -hmm. like some giga stomp, like HLE versus T1. And you're just like, oh God, please like shut your eyes, avert your gaze, right? Yeah. This is a good one. Um, for, for context, the only other team that has a good record against Gen G domestically is actually DRX. They've apparently just oh, wow. won both of their series against uh, in, their, in their round robin against DRX, against uh, Gen G. But in lieu of that, like this is a, they're on the same side of the bracket, so that's good. Damwon is a creative team that is looking a lot better than they did look domestically. I think that this meta is probably just a better one for them. Mm -hmm. They can be more aggressively. Um, honestly, I just feel like other than Naguri, their jungle mid is playing like their top side. I guess outside of Naguri, it would just be jungle mid. It's playing better than they were playing <laughs> domestically. Uh, do I think they're going to win? I have them voted for the win because I think Genji looked really bad in week one week two they got better but was that because rng was dying or was it because they were actually better i don't know um yeah. so to me i'm betting on don one being the ones who have actually done it at worlds multiple times well honestly it, all, all facts tell me that chovy is playing really well like this is not like last year's chovy or the year before that's chovy this he's playing really well they should deserve to win but will they show up I don't think so. So I think three, two for Don one. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably I've a rare actually. Take, but... No. Yeah. It it probably is a rare take because Genji was being so hyped up all year long, mm -hmm. and the roster is crazy. Um. But yeah, I actually do also favor Dan Wong Gaming because I I think the meta mm -hmm. does favor them a lot, mostly because so much focus is taken away from bot lane. Right. The power level of bot lane decreases, and Dan Wong Gaming just gets better because, honestly, this team since its inception has always been a top side focused team right their bot lane when they won uh ghost barrel right they, they were weak side bot lane all the time yeah um so i do think that yeah canyon showmaker naguri like they're gonna be the strong side top top side and 
I mean, Doran is just it. I've just got to say, man, Doran is just not it for me. I, I can't, I can't with Doran, dude. Sometimes he tilts me just watching him play. <laughs> um, <laughs> Peanut also is like, Peanut's got that energy where it's just like sometimes he makes a good play and you're like, did he just luck into that? Sometimes I feel like he just lucked into that good play. Like I really get that vibe so much from, from Peanut. Um, Cause he gets a lot of good stuff done, but I'm just like, yo, it looks like he just did that on accident, but all right works <laughs> um yeah i don't know also uh ruler barrel is genji's current bot lane right or ruler lehens sorry ruler lehens mm -hmm. um i i don't know they don't seem to be as like giga chad as they were in lck like they were actually just like turbo stomping everybody just by themselves it didn't feel like that energy at all it definitely felt like they were slower in lane and slower to get stuff done uh, but then they eventually did. Obviously, they they had that really good game against RNG, where it was a complete dumpster. Um, so, but Damwon Gaming though, okay, Noguri, yes, he has been running it down. But oh my god, like he made like Sejuani top finally feel like, oh yeah, this is why you pick it. Oh mm, wait, this champ yeah. is broken. Yeah. Oh, that's what you're supposed to do. He dumpstered Broken Blade in the one v one, and so is Juani into Fiora, which is a terrible matchup for Sejuani. And I'm pretty sure G2 all yeah, J Yenko is also ganked top and then freaking Broken Blade failed the top dive by not insta flashing after killing uh Nuguri. Like literally Broken Blade lives there if he just insta flashes after killing uh Sejuani out there. That was very frustrating to watch. Um Yeah, I think Damon's gonna take it. I think their top side's better. I think the meta suits them better. Um I I don't know, man. I just I can't believe in Choby V at Worlds. I mean, I know he is looking better this year. He's just a choker at Worlds, though. He does so well in LCK. He's so insane in solo queue. He's so insane everywhere. Yeah, but I don't know. Okay. I'm going Dan Wan 3 2. Well, I think I'm going to take the opposite stand then. Oh, no. oh really? Yeah, yeah no, I'm going, yeah. I'm going Gen G. I just feel like, um, I do feel like Chovy's playing uh, really well. I actually think Peanut's also playing uh, really well. Um, you know, for whatever reason, if it, the eye test, but, you know, their stats look really good. I also think, uh, you know, I love a redemption story. I want Chovy to actually, um, you know, finally shake off the nerves and finish through, right? Uh, they've been hyped. Uh, I think they've looked really good. Uh, not to say that Damwon hasn't looked good, too. So I think this is going to be a great match, but... My gut is telling me I think Gen G pulls us off. I'm also a little bit rooting for them. Uh, I still want T1 to win the whole thing, but whatever. For this yeah. one, I I I, I am just gonna put my hat, uh, my bet on on Gen G. So, um, yeah, that's what, pretty much it. But what, what record? I mean, I again, I have to say three two. Like, it's hard because yeah. you know you said it, Mitchell. There's very like the talent level <laughs> um, among these these you know teams minus Rogue. <laughs> probably like it's, yeah. it's very it's very little so i you know i, I unless i i'm probably going to say three two for almost all the uh, you know other matchups so i do think it's gonna be three two gen g so i just... I, I think it's i think it's a fair way to go because like yeah. in all the years recently it has been three two between the asian teams msi was like that uh worlds last year was like that edg went three two all the way up to their championship right uh and then i'm pretty sure the msi before that we had a three two finals again uh with yep. rng also uh yep. against damn on gaming so um yeah i think three two is the way to go i will say also final point to for damn on gaming is that they did spar against who i think is going to be the best team so i mean damn gaming actually got to play against jdg and i think that mm. gen g had to play against rng with covid and it's just damn on gaming got better practice in in uh in the in the stage games so that's a good point jdg is the best team they're gonna win very good point <sighs> Uh, Kevin, I guess maybe before we go to EDG DRX, unless one of these teams is your one to win it all the way. I feel like me and Kev, me and Mitchell have kind of been saying who are, who are, you know, teams are for all the way. I, I'm going T1. Mm -hmm. Seems like Mitchell said JDG. I don't know if I've heard yours yet, or maybe you have, and oh, I just don't remember yeah. what, what's yours. Yeah. So just full, full transparency i picked top and they just because <laughs> <laughs> hey, big... some of the best yeah. early games in all of lpl okay, right? yeah. so i was like oh they're just gonna yeah. stop their group especially the group they were in yeah. uh in lieu of that i would put jdg i think that they okay. just have that magic they have that look of a team you're like oh my god yeah. what actually beats this in five games like you could beat them once maybe twice but when it comes down to lpl's won eight out of nine best of fives finals in a row or something like that Oof, like something yeah. absurd oh my god that's ins that's insane right 
Yeah, uh, so I think JJG <laughs> wins it all. I want Royal to win, but I think JJG will. Win. Okay, gotcha. All right, all right. Let's go to EDG and DRX then. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, what are your what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think DRX has been like they went from like undervalued, like they were everyone just saying they're crap to yeah. overhyped. I still don't know if I believe in them. It's weird. Right. They just kind of like are there when they lost to top. That's the one game. Okay. If they didn't lose to top the way they did, I was like, oh yeah, no, they look like a good team. This is going to be a very close match. No, they, they got gapped. Like I was yeah. like, oh, this is why they were saying DRX was bad. Cause like, I don't watch as much LCK. <laughs> right. So I just kept hearing DRX is terrible. They won't beat. KT, San, uh, Live Sandbox, whatever. They won't get to Worlds. And they get to Worlds, and they keep winning. I'm like, all right, sure. And then the final game, right when I'm about to believe them, they just get Giga Smurfed on. I was like, what happened, guys? <laughs> what, what, what was that? <laughs> um, so they got gapped hard. I don't think EDG is the type of team to do that kind of gapping this year. But I think EDG has that Worlds experience. They literally came to Worlds. Yep. A lot of DRX, um, there was a meme going around that DRX is essentially lplc number five because a lot of drx played in china mm, yeah uh, so right. Jekka yeah, played in did. china before i don't yeah. remember if king and the def definitely did yeah, and then on EDG. Uh, yeah oh okay yeah yeah Def yeah, was oh, on edg for years oh, no, no, no. Yeah, i thought yeah. you meant zeka yeah yeah def definitely was oh, and yeah, then yeah. pioshik i think he might have also came over but i don't remember he was he's been on a lot of teams the he's, point he's is around, uh, yeah the point is, like, EDG has done this before. They have looked <laughs> shaky. I, I will give you guys that. But, like, are they worse than the fourth seed from Korea in a best of five? I just, I find it very hard to believe that Viper, Mako, especially, like, Mako week two and uh, on his Thresh, I'm like, ooh. He just, like, he's yeah. just like, I'm picking Thresh. I don't even know if this is a good pick, but I'm picking it. And he won two I'm out balanced. of three and then got yeah. stopped by Genji. Or it's a T1. <laughs> But he's still yeah. looking balanced on that character. And honestly, if yeah. that's just one of the draft tools that they showed off. I think they're going to win 3-1. Like, this is the last... This is the one that I don't think is a 3-2. I think that EDG has the experience. I don't think their form is in place. So, in reality, it should be a 3-2. But I think in a best of five, when it all matters, LPL generally wins. Uh, nice, we just yeah. don't have a lot of cross-regional play. And this year, we will, which is yeah. great. Yes. Finally... Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I uh, I'm on the same vibe. I do think. Okay. To DRX credit, though, they had to play against the best team in the world, which is Top Esports. That's already eliminated, right? That's just the best team in the whole goddamn world, because um, they have nothing to play for. Um, so yeah, I think DRX. They. Um, yeah, they they looked really good, right? But they all they did feel like they were in a weak group, right? Their their next best competition was Rogue. Right, LEC team, right, eh, no, whatever. And then it was a super off-beat, off-meta uh, top esports. So um, I do like to just like, yeah, compare like how difficult was your group? DRX's was the easiest for sure to get out of. Good point. Um, yeah. And then EDG had a really tough group. They they played one of the tournament favorites in T1. Um, and then yeah, they had to you know they 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 took the <laughs> in week one right. They gave uh, Fnatic the only win too right. So week one Fnatic was. Also one of the better teams, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. EDG is just a team full of insane players. They've done it before. And yeah, I with um, Pioshik is looking pretty darn good, though. It is his meta, right? Graves' meta is just all about Pioshik. I also think that um, the fact that the pool is very, like, um, you have to ban all these things um, that Zekka can always get, Zir, Silas, or Akali. Those are the things that are nice. If, like, um, Zeka does get targeted and he can't play those three champions somehow, then DRX is getting something else that's really, really insane and broken, right? Um, so we'll see how that goes. It might be one of those things that I actually do think it's going to be 3-2. I do think that it's going to be uh, EDG is going to win. But it could be one of those things where it's just that blue side wins every game. So DRX gets a side selection at the beginning. They start on blue, enemy mm. team, maybe they have to ban too much stuff. And then every time DRX is on blue side, Zeka gets either Azir, Silas, or Akali, they win, right? But then their red side, they actually can't get uh, Azir, Silas, and Akali every time. Uh, or maybe they can. I actually, it's hard to say which what you can give and not give in draft, but it could be one of those games where it's just very, very draft uh, side dependent. Because, yeah, DRX, I honestly think, like, if, if they get Zekka on one of those champions, he's just been one of the best mid laners in the whole tournament. Yeah, I also for think sure. that 
yeah, like if you can get um, Pioshik on Graves or one of his champions that he's comfortable with, he just looks really damn good. It's just when they're not on those things, it doesn't look as good. Uh, I will say shout outs. Oh man, I've been talking so much. I'm sorry, but no, shout outs to <laughs> DRX for doing the Ash Heimer bot lane. Oh my oh, god. Yeah. That is absolute AIDS. What is that? <laughs> Holy cow, dude. Like I was watching um who is it, Barrel? Sit in a bush with Heimer turrets and just one shot somebody. That was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's crazy. That's exciting. I I'm really excited for the DRX drafts. They they've kind of gotten a fan in me in that aspect. But I mean, it's EDG. I love EDG. What a cool team. I hope they win. You know, I hope I hope EDG goes forward. Um, it would be sick. Also, they would be the only t- if EDG wins this tournament, they would be the only team to win it with the same roster back to back. That's a cool story. I would wow. be down for that, Actually, yeah, that's yeah. true. That's so I'm actually kind of low key hoping for that timeline just a little bit. Um, I think that would be sick. Um, and plus, it's just like, how can you hate Viper, man? How can you hate Viper Mako? Like, Viper, um, what was it? It was uh, one of the games where he was, um, he got blocked on the Thresh Lantern and he couldn't escape. And then the Soraka silence also was like screwing him. And you just see him smile. It's like, uh, like, I just love that. He's like, he's, like <laughs> he's just like, wow, they got me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I love good. Viper as a player. He's dope. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know about that uh, EDG story, possible storyline. Lots, lots of pretty cool things to to see in in who ends up winning, like the whole thing. Uh, but I'm 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 just gonna go on EDG. I heard all of y'all's takes with, uh, and I I think the one that pulls me the most is just the experience. I'm a big big fan of experience because I do think uh, typically that's, and especially if you've been in experience and have come out on top, right? Like. That that's that means a lot. I I feel like even if you don't look good, even if you haven't looked good up until this point, um, this happens in other sports all the time. Like there are teams that championship teams that don't look good in the regular season, don't look good in playoffs, but they they kind of find ways to win. And then when it comes to the games that they have to win, they like they pull it out. I, I there's a famous quote that says, uh, "Don't ever underestimate the heart of a champion." And uh, yeah. EDG might have that, especially with the same roster. Like you have the same chemistry. Um, who knows? They might dig deep and, and pull it out, pull it out. So I think, um, yeah, I, I do think because they're playing DRX. Yeah. I do think EDG is going to win this. Um, I'm still going to go three, two. Uh, I do. I'm, yeah, because I'm I think too. DRX is, uh, they have looked good and they are surprising. Uh, you know, so maybe they have the easier group, but it, it, they look, Hey, look, they had still had to win those games. So uh, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, so, so those are all our predictions, but, uh, last thing I wanted to kind of talk about is like, do you guys want to mention anything about what we've been seeing still with the meta and, you know, obviously a lot of Aatrox, Sejuani, Maokai, do you think any of that is going to change? Um, you know, I know the, the bot lane, do you think the Lucian Nami is still going to continue? Um, you know, do you think any of the mid line, mid lane picks like Azir or Akali or Silas, is that going to change? Like, what, what do you guys think? Or do you think there might be some kind of adaptation or do you think there's an adaptation that a team should try into any of these kind of high presence picks so i'll leave it at that like just meta meta talk yeah um i thought it was really interesting that maokai went from like 70 percent win rate from play-ins to week one and then week two is just it just dropped off the face of the earth group stage alone maokai was picked 16 times banned 33 times which is insane right one of the highest presences yeah. at 96 percent. he had a 31 percent win rate he went yep. five and 11 guys so yeah will he still be picked um some of the data was skewed a lot of the losing teams picking out were just the bad teams that they let it get through because they knew they could beat it um i still think it is a good pick is it as broken as i thought before maybe not as broken but it's still good right just like the sejuani when played in the right hands oh my god that's that's yeah. terrifying uh Malkai is still good but it's probably not going to always be picked right sometimes it will be left as a bait pick and whether it's like a mind game right sometimes a, a pick goes to the whole draft doesn't get picked because both teams know that like hey i know you want lucian so we left it up and then it's like ooh, i don't want to pick lucian here anymore and then it just yeah just makes it through the whole draft right so that's the one thing i think lucian is strong uh but it is a very can you play lucian or can you not yeah. You need a bot lane that can do it. If Duckdom and 
What's his name? Is that <laughs> Blanket. Kellen. 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 Sorry. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like they're probably just so forgettable. <laughs> if yeah, they pick Kellen. it, I'm like, oh, if it's them, they're not going to pick it, right? Yeah. But if it's Ruler, right? And the hens, yeah, they're probably going to pick it or at least threaten it, right? So it's it's a team by team basis, not a everyone needs to pick it kind of matter. Whereas Zeri, every team needs to pick this. If you're not, you're going to lose, which I hate him. Um, those are my two big meta things. Uh, the last thing I was going to say is that this is a good meta for some of the Chinese teams because some of the Chinese teams really enjoy playing Viego, and Viego looks like he's getting a resurgence for some reason. Vince is a good character, but they keep making it work, or at least like it keeps showing up, and it's doing well enough. So that's a that's a really big boon in the draft because it was there was no Viego presence basically through plans. Yeah, there was. Yeah, Viego is also one of those champions though where it's like. You know, no matter how far you put him in the ground, that thing is just broken. That is an abomination of a champion. So he will always, I feel like, have a place. Uh, it is also a good thing for owner. Owner's an insane Viego player as well. So, um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, most LC LPL junglers have been absolutely insane on Viego. And you know, you guys already know we're gonna see Lee Sin, right? That's coming out. It's gonna be like this doesn't fit in the draft. It doesn't matter. They're gonna play Lee Sin. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna happen yeah. every once in a while. Um, Graves is gonna be a big pick, I think. Um, Graves is just really strong right now when a lot of the engaged junglers are just a bit weaker, right? Um, Maokai, I will talk about, is, yeah, it is a lot weaker than I thought as well. Um, I thought it was super giga, stupid OP, and it is still really, really strong as a champion, but he has a niche. He has, like, a thing that he's good at, and it's like his early game is super high-potency CC, and then that's it, right? He doesn't really provide much in the early game, but that's enough sometimes to just get a good gank off. And what you are seeing with a lot of Maokais that lose in like competitive matchups. So yeah, when a Maokai is on a bad team and it just loses, not much to talk about, right? But we did see Maokais lose when it was on like when it was between two competitive teams. And something that you'll see about these Maokais is they just sit around, farm, and throw saplings and play vision control game. And I do think while that's a very powerful aspect of Maokai. You need to put on the. You need to put your gas, your gas on the pedal, your your foot on the pedal gas. On the yeah, gas. You got it. Yeah, you got to put your foot on the pedal and pump some gas in there. You got to make <laughs> the ganks happen. You got to just lock people down because honestly, Maokai has one of the most insane level two ganks or level three ganks. It's probably level three ganks that you want to do because you take E into Q. Um, but yeah, he's got really insane ganks and we never see it, right? We saw Malran go absolutely crazy on J4. We should have seen the same things with Maokai. Um, and I do think that Maokai also has this thing where he is one of the strongest mid-game tanks in that he's really tanky and he can skirmish a lot, but he's not the best late-game 5v5 tank. Orn definitely hasn't beat Cho'Gath, Scion, all these other late-scaling um, tank picks. Uh, do outshine Maokai a lot in the later stages. And also, Maokai in top lane, his laning, unless you're really good at it, is actually really difficult to uh, pull off. Because what happens is, most of your trading patterns are pretty weak, and you can, when you trade, you almost always push the wave. But because your trading patterns are so weak, you can't sometimes take advantage of the fact that your spells push the wave while you trade, right? So when you trade with Orn, and he pushes the wave with his AoE abilities, and you, um, he does more damage than you. So you push the wave, and then if Orn doesn't push the wave, he can freeze things on you. Like it's just the other tank has more options than Maokai in lane and top lane, is what I'm seeing. Um, so yeah, I think Maokai is gonna fall off. Hecarim weirdly fell off. I actually right. think he's gonna make a comeback. I actually think Hecarim is gonna come back and do better because he fell off a little too much. Um, and Hecarim is still broken. Hecarim is still very strong. Uh, maybe not as strong as what was thought is in play-ins when he was banned all the time, but yeah, Hecarim is quite good. Um, I will also say that I don't know if any teams are going to, but I think teams 100% should. Can you guys guess it? It's Seraphine. I do think that Seraphine mm. is still legit busted OP and um, that 100 Thieves kind of showed that, you know, even if you play it terribly, it almost beats RNG. Because, yeah, oh my god, their seraphine Senna combo was played so awfully, but it was so broken that they could have played it. I really think if an LPT LP team or LCK team puts a little bit of time into playing Senna Seraphine or just Seraphine in general, um, that thing's busted. That beats Lucianami lanes. Seraphine can solo that lane by herself at some point. She just clears the wave and, and outtrades you. So, yeah, those are some fun stuff in the meta. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think 
the thing we talked about that too because Seraphine was kind of the pick for NA right this year, and I think yep. one thing you know I think both of you had mentioned it before is that like would Asian teams because they weren't really playing it, and it's like would they play it? And I don't know if they will just because of the style being so fast, so skirmishy. Like they don't seem to like to play that type of scale into monsters late game and maybe it's the meta and maybe it's like the reason why Lee Sin will still be picked like th- these their style is just not that way uh like not saying they yeah. can't play it but I don't know if they will and I do agree with you that I, I think it's super strong uh but with just how things have been going um I think that might be one of those curveball picks like where they're just like okay uh we need a win uh, let's throw this curveball in because it doesn't take much practice. They probably have, a, you know, could make it a pocket pick. Um, so yeah. I would like to see that. I, I was just kind of looking at who has the most bands because it pretty much tells me who people don't want to play. Uh, so obviously Yumi is first. And every time she has gotten through, she's won every game. Uh, second is yeah. Aatrox. Yeah. Ugh. Second is Aatrox, which is, uh, you know, not surprising. But third is Caitlyn. Um, so yep. I know. And Caitlyn, uh, I think Alistair mentioned this. Maybe I'll get your thoughts too. Like, to me, Caitlyn hasn't looked like that big of a threat. I know she's really good with Lux. I don't know if she's good with anyone else. But if Lucian, because then it's like, you know, Lucian has been seeing a lot of presence. And if he continues to pop off, he has like a 70% win rate uh, at this point. Like if people start to ban Lucian, you know, do you also ban Caitlyn? So Caitlyn might come through. But what are your thoughts if she actually comes through? Do you think she's actually a good champ? I know the lane prowl. I know they might get early dragons and all of that thing, all of that stuff. But honestly, like, I don't know. Like, I just feel like she's meh. She's okay. Like, she has her strengths, yeah. But I don't think those strengths are good enough to uh, play against, like, these Aatroxes and these Sejuanis yeah. and, you know, stuff that'll just jump on you. When I like went through my memory, I also thought like, yeah, Caitlyn was less impactful than I thought, right? But then I realized all the times she lost, it was Comp from Rogue, Blacker from G2, and Shun from Flying Oysters. So, God like, dang it, it's those teams. And <laughs> all the wins were Ruler, and two Death games were the wins, right? So I was like, yeah. oh, maybe she was just like let mm. through because they're like, oh, we can beat these teams. Don one destroyed Flacket on a. Uh, comp lost to top esports uh, week two top esports after they were eliminated. Like, yeah, I, I think the pick is good. I think for the same reasons Callisto is so good, I think that this pick is used in the same ways. Like, instead of putting a bunch of spears into objective, you put a bunch of traps and you get a lot of spacing that way, right? In a lot of the soft power ways, she just controls a lot of space. Uh, I don't think she's, I don't know why she's banned as much as she is because I don't think she's always usable and there's just like some jungle plus bot lane combo nations that you can just stomp her uh in my mind at least and so far i'm not convinced that it should be as banned as much as it has been yeah but it's probably a scrim monster just like Callista is like you get ahead and this every 80 carries like please for the love of god ban this shit i'm under tower <laughs> yeah, down 30 yeah. cs and four plates sure she has a weak mid game but like tell that to the, her two item lead on me or one item lead on me right so yeah i think she's a very she's very similar to Callista. I I think she's better than Callista as a personal character, but she doesn't have Callista's ult, so they have two yeah. different obvious strengths. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I actually yeah, I it's true. The Caitlyn, the early prio is insane, and I think it's a lot of like scrim bias where a lot of the the teams are just like, just get me out of this freaking lane. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, it. right. It's not but, fun. <laughs> yeah, it's not fun. But yeah, I I actually the the point that League Dad make though, right? And this is what Alistair also uh, talked about is like. Caitlyn's not a tank buster or not a death dance killer, mm-hmm. right? It's he's she really struggles at uh, taking down beefy targets until she's well into the late game. Like we're talking three, four items. Yep. Um, and then so I yeah, when it comes to that, I don't. I do think Caitlyn is actually heavily overrated, and I do think. Oh, I don't know if this will happen. I actually don't think it'll happen, but I think it should happen. Is that Caitlyn should fall out of meta? Because of the existence of Ash and Heimerdinger bot lane. But I think the Ash Heimerdinger bot lane will just make Caitlyn Lux's life miserable. Heimerdinger will struggle a bit against the um, the Kate Lux, but Ash will do so well against those two champions, and the Heimerdinger is there just to defend Ash from getting dove and getting fought at. And I think that that combination is crazy. Ash is really good in lane as well. Uh, she also suffers from the same problem as Caitlyn, though, is that she just doesn't do damage in the later stages of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Especially if you go with the Halo Blades build, you, you do negative damage later on. But um, 
yeah, I mean, if you pick Ashheimer and you counter the cut the Kate Lux strategy, and you first pick Caitlyn or something, and then the enemy team gets to answer with other stuff and pick Ashheimer Dinger later, that seems like a pretty good draft for the mm. enemy team. Yeah. So the Kate bands, it's like. I mean, are you first picking Kate? Are you second rotation in Kate? Like, where are you picking it, right? right? And then what are you picking else instead? So I, I'm not a fan of the Kate as much in this meta. Yeah. I think Ash Heimerdinger solved that one. Honestly. I'd love to see more yeah. of that lane, actually. That'd be that's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. But uh, it's funny. It's just yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah, thing. it's funny. Yeah, <laughs> that's all to see it. Uh, okay. Uh, any final thoughts? Uh, I think that was all that was on the docket. But do you guys have any final thoughts moving into the quarterfinals? Do we think that Top Esports Tian should be the winner of the Dade Award this year? Or do you think that week <laughs> two after it didn't matter is enough to excuse it? Because he did play pretty well in their last two wins, right? Like, they, they just played well. He played quite yeah. well. Yeah. One of the things that came to mind is uh, one time they put the Heimer turret down in Bush, the Bob Bush, and he skirted it around the Heimer turret because he just knew the Heimer turret can't see the whole lane. I was like... How the hell do you know that? Uh, uh, like, wow. Apparently, they're probably scrimming it a lot, but I'm like, oh, that's very smart. And they actually got a gank off as a result. Wow. So if the second week counts, even when they're eliminated, then I don't think he gets the award. But otherwise, I do think he gets the award because he was the he's a world finals MVP. He's the LC LPL first team jungler, and he was the finals MVP. Or no, he was not. He didn't win, so there's no way he was. He didn't but win. He was at least he was first team. He was first team. He's very hyped. He was considered yes. very, very good. Mm-hmm. He was also considered very, very good when he was on FPX literally last year. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Tien. Yeah, I'll get. I mean, it's actually I don't know who gets the Dottie Award, who deserves it more. Honestly, it's hard to say. Maybe Knight. Knight played pretty whatever. Jackie Love. I don't know. It's anybody on top played, esports. I thought Knight played pretty well, actually. All things considered. I thought his Ari in the GAM game was so terrible. I thought it was really bad. That dude was whiffing hard in Ari. <laughs> uh, yeah, in that's GAM fair. Game. But his first Ari game was Giga Smurf. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. He he played overall, I would say Knight has just been over- underwhelming as a as a player in general when he when considering the hype he gets in LPL. Yeah. So that that one is a close one for me, but I mean Tien, he's actually won it all, and he was actually insane in LPL, uh, and he did look terrible, and mm-hmm. you know he did the same thing last year on FPX, so I'm down yeah. to give it. To, <laughs> I'm down to give yeah, it I'm to down. Tien. I think for, I'm down too. Yeah, give it I think yeah, at least tentatively, unless Chovy just like yeah. completely gets oh, giga, giga yeah. gap right, because it's it's at the end of worlds, right? So I'm just yeah, saying yeah. right yeah. now, who yeah. is it, right? And it's by de facto yeah. should be Tien, right? So that's what yeah. I was thinking as well. True. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, Chovy, you better win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Chovy. That's Yo, right. actually though, if Chovy falls out and they lose to Damon Gaming, oh my god, Genji is going to be that is just de- like isn't oh, that yeah. well, that'll be like the third or fourth time in a row where Chovy's gotten eliminated in quarters, right? Mm-hmm. It's like been almost every year. It was he Griffin in 2019, Han- uh, Hanwha Life in 2020 uh, against Damon actually or uh, I think. And uh, then he whoop. fell in Emmys on Genji, or was he on Genji last year? He no. was not on Genji last year. Wasn't he on um, freaking DRX or last year? Oh, I he was remember. on DRX with Caria and some other maybe, people. Maybe, maybe that was it. Whatever it is, Chovy has not made it far at Worlds ever. Like yeah. he's definitely not made a finals. If he's yeah. made it to semis, it was only once, and he's just gotten knocked out in quarters, almost always by the LCK res- representative too, which is really sad. Hit yeah, Chovy gets a lot of civil wars, man. That's yeah. rough for him. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it's going to be exciting. Yeah. Mitchell, did you have any last thoughts? You good? I don't know. I have so much I want to say. It's just, I what know. do I leave it off with? Um, <laughs> NA, right? Let's just talk about, let's just leave the things off with NA. Things are going to get worse before they get better, if they do get better. And I do think that if we burn it all down this next coming year in 2023, and all of our budgets are cut, all the numbers are down, and all of our players are gone. You know what? That's the time to stay positive. Honestly, I'm going to tune in to watch the dumpster fire, maybe even more than usual. <laughs> yeah, just, just for the drama. I just want to see what it looks like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious. Curious, like. yeah. <laughs> um, this is oh, going to be God. the most insane off season. Not for uh, the reasons that we've had in previous years, where it's yeah. like, this is the most stacked TL roster ever, to being like, this is the most crappy roster ever. Let's go. You know what? <laughs> but out of the ashes... Uh, you know, 
but what's the saying? I don't even know the saying. A phoenix will rise, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Yes. Like you know what phoenix I mean? Like rise again. <laughs> well, like it's kind of like what what's left, right? Well, maybe it'll just be all new talent, like who we don't know, because I think NA has pretty much fed up with the the big names of you know exorbitant contracts and not doing anything and so maybe now it will be the time for those that are hungry like i'm still super hyped for jojo right yeah he didn't have the yeah, best worlds hey. but young talent he's yeah he's pretty good he's got hands he you know can still develop but i want to see more of that i want to see who's left and who really shines and takes the opportunity to be like finally like you don't know me yet, but you will, and this is my year to prove it. So hopefully that we can't will... do worse at Worlds. That's all. Exactly. I'm saying. Like, we, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Ten times less and do the same, or okay, uh, 018, yeah, well, but who cares all right. at that point? Yeah. So new no, NA, yeah, new NA yeah. Hopium. We're ending it on a positive note. We believe in our new hey, uh, undiscovered we can talent. Do it. We can do it, yeah. guys. We, we can, can do, do it. it. You know, <laughs> new talent, baby. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Let's, Jojo, Calvary, let's, end, yeah, let's end on let's end on that high, Matthew's man. Let's gonna get a starting spot. Oh man, I can't. Oh wait. gosh. Yeah, can't wait. <sighs> okay. Let's well, go. Okay, well that's gonna do it. We're gonna end right roster, there. Pro- positive <laughs> note, we're <laughs> ending it right there. So once again, thank you, Kevin and Mitchell, for joining and always sharing your wise thoughts. Until next time, enjoy your climb on the rift. Try not to be too toxic. And we'll see you all on the next episode. Peace.